Al Jazeera podcast. This is Darna in eastern Libya. It's a coastal city of about 100,000 people. And on Monday, entire parts of it were washed into the Mediterranean Sea. A state of emergency in eastern Libya. Widespread floods have killed thousands of people and left thousands more unaccounted for. I just remember closing my eyes thinking, I wish those people would just stay home instead of going to go film all that footage. For Ayat Manena, on the other side of the world in Canada, where she lives, watching the floods unfold was devastating. Her family is from Derna, and their roots run deep. Derna is a place of great reverence for myself and for my family. It is where we trace our origins, and therefore we are always connected to it. It is devastating, and that word seems so unable to capture what any of this could signify or mean. Darna was in the path of Storm Daniel. It dumped a year's worth of rain on Libya in 24 hours. Then, the disaster struck. Two dams holding huge amounts of water burst, sending a giant wave towards the city. The dams collapsed. 30 million cubic meters of water raced directly toward Darna. It's unfathomable that the scenes that those that survived have seen and those that have perished have had to, it had to go through, you know, in their last breaths. To be swept into the sea at such a extreme, extreme force. Today, a look at what's happened in Libya so far. And as climate change gets worse, what might be next? I'm Malika Bilal, and this is The Take. My name is Ayat Mnena. I am a Canadian Libyan in Ontario, Canada. Both my dad's side and mother's side of my families originate from Derna. A few days before the the floods hit, they, the officials were warned. It was widely known that they should brace for a storm. Its extent, of course, no one could predict, but the people of Derna, the people of, of Eastern Libya, had expected that they would be essentially back on lockdown for a few days, just that they would stay home, stay indoors, and not go out until the storm blows over. People were following orders to stay indoors, including Ayat's relatives. But some people went out to film that footage that Ayat saw. And she ended her Sunday night feeling uneasy. There's a valley that bisects through the heart of the city, and usually that valley just allows water to flow from the mountains and the higher areas and through the city and into the sea. So I went to sleep that night having seen the footage of the water flowing. It was quite high, it was quite choppy, it was dark. And the next day I woke up at 6 a.m. I just didn't feel comfortable. I just woke up and I wanted to check on what was happening. I tried to call my aunt, I tried to call my cousin in a nearby city of Albeida, which was also impacted by the floods and everybody was offline. I sent my dad's sister a message as well, just saying, you know, let us know you're okay. Ayat says she and her parents spent the whole day just trying to get as much information as they could from family on the ground and from social media. It's just post after post after post of lists of names of families that have been essentially wiped away. In Libyan culture, multi-generational homes are how many people live. They build on top of their parents, you know, and it ends up being like a three-level, four-level family home with multi-generations of families under one roof. And so um, you're seeing names in these lists of entire generations, entire families, entire tribes being lost 
in seconds. There have been cousins and, and extended family that have been lost. And my parents have just resigned to watching their city be no more. And of course, there's another element of how disasters like these could be anticipated, prevented, minimized. And there is a lot, a lot to be said about that. Lack of preparedness, decades of neglect, irresponsible on the part of those in power. Libya is a deeply divided country with a government in the East and one in the West. Libya, a state with two competing governments who view each other as illegitimate. Darna is in the East, which is controlled by the government led by General Khalifa Haftar, and fighting in recent years has gone up and down. Now, there are lots of questions and anger about how prepared Libya was for such a disaster. But initially, before the flood struck, there was even a moment of humor. You know, on Sunday, I was, I was sat with friends and we were laughing about videos from the initial rains and storms whereby, you know, kids were kind of diving off of pickup trucks into the water. Tariq Majrisi is a senior policy fellow at the European Council on Foreign Relations. You know, this is typical Libyan black humor where we kind of just laugh about something like this, which, you know, if you think about it, really represents the complete neglect of infrastructure and governance um, that a country like Libya really should not be suffering from, um, and which would manifest itself again in the coming days in a much darker reality. Tariq explained that the catastrophic dam failure was itself a consequence of Libya's political divisions. Libya's divisions are in themselves an intrinsic manifestation of Libya's politics. Um, And it is that which I think transformed a a regular environmental disaster into what is now a a historic catastrophe. I mean, I really can't describe how how bad it is. You know, the underlying reality of what this division is, this, this quest for power, and the very, very real political realities that it has manufactured and that it has imposed on the Libyan people uh, is what created this catastrophe. You know, from the, from the neglect, the absolute negligence and neglect towards governance and even basic duties like maintaining infrastructure. Tariq said there had been warnings previously that the dams could fail. I mean, for goodness sake, there was a report just last year published by the University of Sebha, which stated that if immediate measures were not taken to maintain the dams, then a disaster could occur. So this event was prophesized. They, they, they said it would happen and, and nothing was done to, to buttress these dams. Uh, so from that negligence in the first place um, to the point where the city of Darna was itself weakened um, because the reconstruction money for it was embezzled. Uh, and the reconstruction that needed to occur in the first place uh, was only because of a brutal war that was prosecuted as part of this power game. In eastern Libya, That power game has resulted in a military government, the one led by Khalifa Haftar. And Tariq says the repressive environment that the government has created has made matters even worse, starting with the military administration that forced people to remain in their homes. They imposed a curfew rather than an evacuation, and they took absolutely no precautionary measures. So from all of that to to the lack of of civil society organizations who are now able to offer aid and support in Derna and elsewhere, or even journalists, uh, local journalists, able to report and to communicate. Why are these people available? Because they're all in jail, jailed by the military administration, uh, or they've been scared off and intimidated away from pursuing this line of work. Uh, And so in the aftermath of this tragedy, what do we have in in their place? Um, We have poor, traumatized, completely untrained uh, civilians who are just there because they are desperate to help. They feel like they have to do something. Uh, They have to help in some way, but they have no clue what they're doing, bless them. Um, They're not trained in search and rescue. They're not trained in disease mitigation or any of these things. They're putting their lives at risk, and some of them are even dying. But Tariq also says that these divisions between governments don't reflect the people. Libya itself, Libyans are not divided. 
Uh, you can see that in all the convoys and all the people streaming towards eastern Libya now from all corners of the country because they want to help. Uh, Libyans are together uh, and they're trying to do what they can to resolve this crisis, whereas Libya's politicians are, are very complicit in making this the catastrophe it was. After the break, a look at the response on the ground and the role of climate change. By Wednesday in Darna, crews were still working to retrieve bodies from the sea and the rubble. The challenge for rescue workers now is simply getting to Derna. Roadways in and out remain flooded, stalling convoys of aid. A doctor in Benghazi, the biggest city in eastern Libya, is among those helping with the response. I'm Ahmed Tarabolsi from Benghazi, Libya. And Derna is only 300 kilometers away from my city. And we hear all about it from the local news and uh, from uh, all the people. That's the only thing that we are talking about right now. So uh, the situation there is there's no uh, any communication whatsoever, internet or uh, local phones. Uh, and the city is the main roads that contact, that connect the city, especially with the east part. With the west part is broken, so there is only one road, I think, to the east. So um, lack of the trained, well-trained uh, rescue uh, rescue teams make it a much larger uh, disaster. Malik Trena, Al Jazeera's reporter for Libya, has been covering the response from the west. I'm currently at the Matiga airport in Tripoli, where international rescue teams uh, are coming in. Malik said that the storm has prompted a moment of unity in a divided country. What we're starting to see is people coming together. I mean, there's just been an outpour of support. I was at a donation center a little while ago, and just, you know, people are coming in with whatever, are bringing in whatever they can, water, food, medicine, uh, 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 blankets, uh, medical equipment, uh, so people from across the country are coming together. But unity's not enough. Ahmed, the doctor, says Libya's not ready to deal with more storms like this one, and that even what happened this week could have been avoided if Libya had better governance. I can easily say, no, it's not prepared for more storm like this. Because uh, actually, uh, we can manage to uh, spare this unfortunate event if there's a good maintenance of these uh, two dams uh, that take the city from the flood. But uh, the reasons, because a lot of corruption and the government's there. But Libya's lack of preparation wasn't for lack of prediction. The storm this week had already caused damages and deaths in southern Europe, days before reaching North Africa. I had been following um, Hurricane Daniel before it made landfall uh, in Greece for quite a few days, actually, uh, because it was expected to bring such an extreme amount of rainfall within a short span of time, uh, which it ultimately did. Karim al Gindi is a climate consultant based in London. And he explained how climate change likely contributed to the severity of the storm in two ways. The first way was the disruption of the changes that climate change has caused to the jet stream, which is a fast stream of air running at higher altitudes in the mid-latitudes of the northern hemisphere. And this impact of climate change on it has led to the jet stream becoming more wavy and also to becoming slower. The second way in which climate change has affected it is an increase in the sea surface temperature. And that has uh, supported storms in gaining strength and increasing in speed and in the increase in precipitation when it makes landfall. So the two elements together have created the conditions uh, that would allow such storm to happen in the Mediterranean, which is rare, but also increase the intensity of such storms when they do make landfall, either in Greece or in Libya. 
With storms like these likely to keep coming, Ayat says the concerns go far beyond Libya. We all need to come together to help those in the, the most vulnerable situations. And in this case, it doesn't matter, you know, the, the, the facade uh, that a country like Libya has where it is, you know, it leads with the fact that it is a resource-rich nation. Its civilians, its citizens don't see a penny of that. These are people that have been left alone to their own devices to face something that it was not their responsibility to avoid. They are just regular people living everyday life and, and it, it is an absolute crime that this should have happened and to this extent. And that's The Take. For all the latest on the rescue operation in Libya, head to our website at aljazeera.com. This episode was produced by David Enders, Ashish Malhotra, and Zaina Bether, with Amy Walters, Chloe K. Lee, Miranda Lynn, Sari Al-Khalili, Faranisa Campana, Khalid Sultan, Sonia Bagat, and me, Malika Bilal. Our sound designer is Alex Roldan. Alexandra Locke is The Take's executive producer, and Nay Alvarez is Al Jazeera's head of audio. We'll be back.